conversation with some coworkers this week, and um, they don't like to believe in hell and things like that. And um, I was saying, you know, well, the Bible says there's a hell, and if the Bible says it, that's, that is true, you know. And um, the responses I was getting was, well, how do you know the Bible's true? People who read the Quran think that's true, so what do you say about those people? And I feel like I did an okay job answering them, but I thought to myself later, I wonder what Pastor Burnett would have said. <laughs> because, you know, we talked a lot this morning about our views not being political, but based on what the Bible says. And so I feel like maybe, I know I could use a refresher on maybe the three or four things you would respond to, you know, with that, and maybe I'm not the only one in here. But which half? Uh, about hell or why the Bible's true? Or why both? The Bible's true, or how we can know that every, everything that we read is true. Because everything that I base, you know, what I think on is because the Bible says it, so. Okay, the yeah. veracity of scriptures, okay. Can I give you a part two as well? Oh, always, or well, three one, or four. One comment was, well, the Catholic Bible, and can you just clarify, does the Catholic Bible just have, like, a few extra books? And why don't we include them, I guess? Otherwise, I think they're the same. Is that true? Yeah, the, the, it's, it's more than a few. It's about a dozen. It's called the Apocrypha. Um, Apocrypha, um, and uh, basically they're books like uh, First and Second Maccabees and and Tobit or Tobit and Judith and I don't even know the names of all of them, uh, but um, the Catholic Bible, a, a, a normal Catholic Bible, which contains this, the rest of it, like the Douay, uh, do. I don't even know how you spell do I, but it's the official, the old official Catholic Bible. You can lead some of the Lord from that. In fact, I read the Catholic Bible, and I have it all marked up because some people say, oh, that's just in your Bible. I say, no, 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 it's in yours too. See, it's got the imprimatur of, you know, the archbishop of wherever, and it's your Bible, the do I. The do I, the Jerusalem Bible, the Catholic editions have a very good text of the Bible, very similar to ours, and they insert this Apocrypha. Now basically, the Apocrypha are books that are from, um, part of them are from the period between Malachi and Christ in this, what we call the intertestamental period. It's 400 years of silence between Malachi, the last Old Testament prophet, and John the Baptist heralding the coming of Christ. There were 400 years there. And in this time, we have all of these books, which are, well, there's Bell and the Dragon. Um, some of them are very fanciful. They're kind of like Lord of the Rings kind of stuff. Some of them are just histories of the exploits of the fighting going on during the Greek and Persian uh, periods in this 400 years. But the reason I say that is when Jesus Christ came, he called a body of scriptures, or a body of literature, he called them the scriptures. Um, and uh, let, let me just show you, look in Luke 24, how Jesus treats the Bible um, and how he designates it. When he's having that Bible study on the Emmaus Road in Luke 24, uh, he, he's in verse 27 of Luke 24, we find Jesus calls the Old Testament the scriptures. So he calls the Old Testament, and the way we know it's the Old Testament, you notice he said, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So Jesus called the Old Testament books he called those scripture. Now, what's interesting is we know exactly which Old Testament books Jesus believed. There were 22 of them. And uh, they were assembled by Ezra, who is right out of the Bible. And they were called from the, the Old Testament period on the scriptures. They were called the 22 books that God inspired. Now why I'm saying that is, Jesus, right here, Jesus, in AD 30, 
after all of these apocryphal books were written, these books were written in this period, before Christ's birth. So all of those books that the Catholics have inserted into their Catholic Bible were extant, they were present, they were in circulation. And Jesus never elevated these books to this level, to Scripture. Now, why would the Roman Catholics want the Apocrypha? Well, for one reason, purgatory is not in the Bible. But purgatory is in the Apocrypha, in these books. You can find in these books, in 2 Maccabees, I think it's in 12, you find purgatory. That's not a scriptural concept, to send people to a halfway house to burn for a while, to get rid of some of their sins because they didn't have enough of their sins forgiven before they died, and they have to work them off by burning candles and praying for dead people. All of that is in 2 Maccabees. And so the Roman Catholics wanted to sew in the apocryphal books, make them canonical, so that some of the doctrines that are not in the, in the scriptures could be verified and kind of supported. But, so, uh, you know, I don't want to get into intertestamental history and all that, but the main reason why the, the Roman Catholic Apocrypha is not to be considered like scriptures is Jesus didn't consider it scripture, and they were all there. They were piled up, and they were right there, and he could have said, and yeah, and Judas, and Bell, and the dragon, and Maccabees, that plus the Old Testament uh, scripture. Now, you say there's 22, or you didn't say it, I did. Uh, 22 books in the Old Testament, they, they did not split Chronicles into first and second and Samuel into first and second, and Kings into first and second. They also, uh, the Old Testament canon with tw the 12 minor prophets as one book. That's, that covers some of the discrepancies people see in the Bible because Jesus said, as it says in Hosea, and when he quotes, it's not in Hosea, but they called Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nehemiah, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah. They called it by the first book in the, the, the Minor Prophets, and Hosea is the first of the 12. And so if you do the math and you, out of the 39, take out the, the 12, plus all of these subdivisions, plus Ezra and Nehemiah uh, are um, one book with them, uh, you end up with the very same 39 that we have, only they were just in, they were in 22 groupings like that. So that's the Catholic Bible. But here's the bigger question. Why, why today in the 21st century, uh, why should we believe that the Bible is inspired? And it really, uh, or, or in the veracity of the scriptures, why should we believe that the scriptures are inspired? Now, we know what the scriptures are because Jesus identified the Old Testament 39. So first of all, how do we know what the scriptures are? The way we know it is Jesus called the Old Testament, he called that scriptures. So right there from Genesis to Malachi Jesus affirmed that including Jonah and Esther and every other of the 39 or of the Old Testament books that were the 22 of his day Jesus called all of that scripture so there has never been any question about the Old Testament in other words the Old Testament is solidly set that it is inspired and it is a package that, that Jesus recognized, read, taught from, believed, affirmed, verified. So Daniel, and the lion's den, and Jonah, and the whale, and all the things liberal people don't like. 
theological liberals that say, oh, you know, that crossing the Red Sea, that didn't really happen. Oh, you know, the, all those Old Testament, oh, those probably didn't happen. Jesus believed they happened. But then Jesus said, and, and if you look at this, look at what the promise is in John. Um, let's see, I will bring all things. It's about John 16, the second. I will bring all things to your remembrance. Um, come on, whoever finds it first. Um, Jesus promised, I will bring all things to your remembrance uh, while well, someone finds it. Someone must have your little Bible app. You can look it up. 1426. What, 1626 did you 14. say? 1526? 1426. 1426, oh. Well, I'm only off by two, that's good. Um, there we go, 1426. It, it's, it's Jesus promising the Holy Spirit. And it says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things I said to you. Now, a lot of kids claim that for tests. <laughs> and they say, bring it all to my remembrance. You know, I played fantasy football all night, but bring it all to my remembrance. No, no, no. This was a promise for the apostles and the inspiration of the scriptures. So basically what Jesus does is, Jesus promises that the scriptures are going to come through his chosen ones, and every New Testament book was either written by an apostle or by an associate of an apostle. And the associates of the apostles are James, the brother of our Lord, his earthly brother, Jude, so James, Jude, another brother of Christ, Luke, an associate of the Apostle Paul, and Mark, an associate of the Apostle Peter. And every New Testament book, Christ promised his spirit would bring all things to their remembrance, whatever he had taught them. Have you ever wondered how how they could remember those minute details about, you know, how Jesus healed the person and what they said. And, and if you look at, at uh, you know, Matthew was written about A.D. 50, and Mark was written by Peter maybe in the same time period, and Luke uh, was written probably uh, about 58 or something like that, and John is written way later, probably, uh, you know, uh, around A.D. 70 or before. He doesn't mention the destruction of the temple, but, but those four Gospels are sure a long time after the event. And how did they record even exact conversations? I can't remember something that happened yesterday. And they were doing that. It's because of this promise in John 14, 26 and other places, especially... Uh, what Paul tells us in, in 2 Timothy 3 and what Peter says in uh, 1 Peter 1 that the Spirit would breathe out, uh, inspire, and the Holy Spirit would, for Romanoi, would, would guide them. So the Old Testament is a closed case. Jesus affirmed it. The New Testament is Jesus promised it. He said, you are going to, 1426, I'm going to bring all things to remembrance that I said to you, by the helper, the Holy Spirit. So it's a promise of inspiration. So basically, why should we believe the scriptures are inspired? I have seven reasons. You asked for two or three. My first one, and the only one you really need is, Jesus did. He believed the Bible was inspired. Jesus did. I don't really need any more evidence than that, because if you don't believe in Jesus, then you can't be saved anyway, right? Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So if you meet someone that says, well, I don't believe that Jesus is real, that Jesus is historic, that Jesus said that, then we have a bigger problem than the inspiration of Scripture. Salvation is connected to Jesus Christ. That's why... The, 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 the way to test the spirits is, who do they say Jesus is? Is he the Christ, the Son of God, or is he, as we've talked about with the cults, they all make Jesus something else. So Jesus believed 
that the scriptures were inspired. So I believe the Bible is inspired, number one, because Jesus did. Number two, because those closest to him, the apostles did. The apostles believed that they were writing, and so did the prophets. The apostles and prophets both believed. In fact, uh, about 3,000 times, they say in the Bible that the Lord said this. Thus says the Lord. God said this. God told me. Uh, Moses said, you know, in fact, look at, look at how often he says it. Um, if, if you look in your Bibles, look in Leviticus, how often it says this repeated concept. The Lord called to Moses, the very first word of, uh, first line of the book of Leviticus, the Lord called to Moses. And then if you keep going through, all the way through this book, it says like chapter four, the Lord spoke to Moses. All of the scripture writers in the Old Testament, uh, chapter five of Leviticus, verse 14, the Lord spoke to Moses. Chapter six, verse one, the Lord spoke to Moses. They believed God told them what to write. And they believed that, they recorded that, and they delivered it to a body of literature that Jesus held. Remember in the temple or in the synagogue, he got up and got the scrolls. He held the Old Testament scriptures. And he said, this, Jesus said, this I'm holding are the holy scriptures. This is God's word. So I believe it because Jesus believed it. I believe it because the apostles believed it. Uh, then you can go through a lot of other ones. Uh, every scientific Every scientific fact in the Bible is true. I mean, Job talks about things that scientists didn't discover for thousands of years or didn't observe until thousands of years after Job. Job talked about uh, the rotation of the earth. Uh, Job talked about the fact that, that there is... A, a, deep sea currents. We're talking about deep ones. He talks about the rivers that are, that are in the ocean. Uh, he, he talks about the, the fact that the earth hangs on nothing. I mean, the current scientific thought or theory of the day when Job was around and after was that the earth was on the backs of elephants. Mm -hmm. And when they twitched, it was earthquakes. I mean, that's really solid, you know, <laughs> views. But he says the earth hangs on nothing, and he said it turns like clay to the cylinder. You know, they've just been in the news, a 4,000-year-old tablet that describes Noah and the ark. That is written with, they used to take clay tablets, and they had a cylinder, and they would roll it on an axis across, and that's how they would seal their letter, or they would write on their little clay cuneiform I know they use little styluses, but when they'd signed, they would roll a seal across it. He said that the earth rotates on an axis, is what Job said. He actually said that. And the book of Job predates Moses. Probably Moses wrote it. But Job's life is from the time of Abraham. So we're talking about over 4,000 years ago, God told him, all kinds of things. I mean, he talked about migration of animals and how the Lord does that. People didn't really know all that stuff. And so all this scientific knowledge, uh, there's also historic accounts, and I've told you this many times, that uh, Ramsey said about Sir uh, William Ramsey. Um, he said about to disprove the Bible, so he was a unbeliever from Britain and an archeologist, and he said, okay, I'm just gonna take the book of Acts, and I'm going to do what it says. And he sailed to the first town of, of Paul's missionary journey, like it said. And he says, and he traveled three days. So he said, I'm going to walk three days up the Roman road. And if the Bible's true, there will be a city here. Because it said Paul traveled three days. And he got to a city that was called Pisidian Antioch. And Ramsey said, there's no way there's going to be that. That's just... Paul made all that up. And so he excavated three days out, 
and he found Pisidian Antioch that was unknown to archaeologists till he dug it up. And it said that when Paul was in um, Thessalonica in Acts 17, uh, he called he called the the rulers of the city of Thessalonica. He called them Asiarchs and Ethnarchs. And those words were not known until they excavated the city. And there in the stone of their public buildings were the exact words from the New Testament. So what, what archaeology has done is verified everything that they've dug exactly fits with what the Bible says. And every scientific fact that the Bible explains. Every one of them are, are verifiably, and, and you could talk about fulfilled prophecy, uh, and there are many of them. They're all exactly fulfilled the way that, that God said uh, they would. And then there's the, what I call the um, unity, it would be a good word for it, but but what's amazing is the Bible was written by 40 different men over 1,600 years uh, on three different continents. The majority of those authors never met each other. And most of them wrote without having read what the others wrote. How would you like to do a term paper on one theme and have 40 collaborating authors, but it's over 16 centuries, you're on all different continents, and most of the time you never meet each other. And you just throw your work together and give it to the teacher to read. And that, that is a description of the supernatural integrated message that the Bible has. From cover to cover, it is absolutely integrated like an engineer like a single engineer supervised the writing of it. And of course we know that that supernatural engineer is the Holy Spirit. And then the final thing is how the Bible has endured. Uh, there is no book. Uh, you remember Voltaire said that in I don't know how many years the Bible would cease to exist and he has and the Bible hasn't. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean the red <laughs> Chinese tried to drive away the the Bible and the Bible has endured the, the Romans. In fact, uh, uh, what's amazing is in, in um, AD, uh, one of the greatest persecutions uh, was from 303 to about, actually it's, it's probably 302 to 312, but just roughly from AD 303 to 313, and a guy named uh, 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 Diocletian gave the, the greatest persecution that the church ever faced. And he did three things. He destroyed every Bible. There is not a complete copy of the Bible before this date. There is not one single manuscript of the Bible that predates that in its entirety. He succeeded in destroying every, he destroyed every church meeting place, every building he destroyed, empire-wide, just, just systematically destroyed them. And every known leader of the church, he arrested or martyred or something. I mean, he had the most, uh, this guy was an, in, was an incredible administrator. In fact, he, he's the only Roman emperor that retired. He said, I've done enough of that. And he moved to modern-day Dalmatia, down in, the, down in Croatia somewhere, and built a perfect city for himself to live in. But this guy, and then Constantine took over after him, but this guy, he said, I'm going to get rid of Christianity once and for all. I'm going to destroy every building, kill every leader, destroy every Bible. And yet, we have it. What the church did is, they and it's what we experienced when I used to deliver Bibles in Eastern Europe. When, when the church would get a Bible, they would real quickly, before the police came, they'd tear out and give one family Genesis, and give someone else Exodus, and they broke it up and fanned it out so that it would still be, 
if they got the Smith family, that, you know, the Joneses still had part of the Bible. And that's what the early church did. And so that's why now our, our New Testaments are derived from 25,000 fragmentary manuscripts. 25,000 Greek manuscripts because Diocletian destroyed every complete codex, every complete copy with all of the New Testament books all gathered together. And uh, of course the Jews preserved, like the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Old Testament, but the New Testament. And, and so what that tells us is you can trust the Bible because it's the most enduring book. We have 25,000 uh, copies, as it were, of the New Testament. Do you know how many copies we have of the Iliad and the Odyssey? Does anybody doubt that the Iliad and the Odyssey is a, is a legitimate piece of literature? There are only four or five of some of the greatest known ancient documents. There are three, two, five, six. There are 25,000 manuscripts of the New Testament because God said, this is his book that he was going to preserve. He uh, had one overarching author, the Holy Spirit, fulfilled prophecy. Uh, that's a whole, I mean, that is one of the most powerful. God says in Isaiah, fulfilled prophecy is his signature. You know how someone signs a check? You can get one if it's unsigned. It, it isn't really valuable. Um, God said that prophecy is my signature, so you know who I am. So prophecy is one. The, the incredible historic accuracy of the Bible. Have you ever read the Book of Mormon? The Book of Mormon is ridiculous. I mean, it names people and places in America that with all the billions that the Mormon church has, they can't produce a shred of evidence of any of that stuff that's written in there. It's just, it's just uh, historic fiction. The Bible, not one historic fact in the Bible has ever been disproved, controverted. Scientifically, I mean, we have, we have even black matter, you know, uh, the largest constant part of the universe is what they call black matter. It talks about that in the book of Job. It talks about he divides the, the darkness from the light, and the, it talks about in, in physics terms almost what we see in the universe of, of the, the mass of the universe being invisible, this dark matter. And then the 3,800 times the convinced the apostles and prophets were, but this is the real reason, because Jesus believed it. And then one last question. Uh, or one last answer to this is that, that what's fascinating about the Bible is that when Jesus, right here, when Jesus said that the Bible is true, the Bible he quotes from, Jesus quoted. If you study Jesus' quotations, uh, quotations from the Old Testament, about 70, I, I don't know the exact number, let's say 60% plus of the time, Jesus does not quote from the Hebrew Bible. Jesus quotes from the translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek. And so a lot of people, I, I meet people and they go, oh, I wish I could have, you know, I wish I could understand Greek, you know, then I could really read the Bible. Do you know what Jesus did? Jesus, God in human flesh, did not primarily quote from the Hebrew Old Testament. S way high in the 60s percent of the time, whenever Jesus quotes what the Old Testament said, he quotes from the Greek translation, which is just like us having this English translation of the Old and New Testament. Jesus primarily taught from a translation, not from the original. And I think that's fascinating. And by the way, uh, Paul did the same thing. I think it was to tell us, you don't need to know Greek and Hebrew to hear of God. You can get, now you have to make sure that you have what, what we would call a literal translation 
Uh, and, and those are the popular Bibles. Uh, you know, the, the original in English King James, New King James family. And then we have the ESV and, and New American. But those are the literal ones. The ones that are dynamic, which is like the NIV, they are still pretty, pretty solid, but they no longer reflect a literal translation. A little, literal translation is you have Greek words like this, and a literal translation places above it an English word above each of the Greek or Hebrew words. A dynamic translation. So this is literal. This is, this is the kind that Jesus used. But this kind, the, and, and by the way, uh, the you know, Good News Bible and you know, Eugene Peterson's Bible, the message isn't even a translation, it's just a paraphrase. But the newer Bibles coming out are this dynamic equivalency. And what that means is you have the Greek text down here. And when, when you cross from Greek and Hebrew into English, what they do is they say, well, this word kind of means what those words mean. And this word kind of means what, you know, a little bit of that one and this one. And it's, it's kind of like dynamic, that, that kind of like the Bible, we don't want to be uh, too wooden and try and exactly know what God said like these do. That's why they accuse the literal translations of being wooden, archaic, et cetera, et cetera. But they're preserving the word order, the, the exact translation of the Greek and Hebrew words. And so it, it takes, you have to really study it. These are more flowy. And what they say is that we're, we're keeping the thoughts and the ideas, but not the words. And see, this is what God inspired. And if you don't anchor the translation to what God inspired, then all of a sudden you have what's going on in churches nowadays. People don't even carry Bibles in most churches. They just want ideas, thoughts, um, uplifting, encouraging messages that kind of reflect what God said but we don't want to be wooden and tied. And so all of a sudden, if the Bible says that a woman uh, should not teach or exert authority, what they say is, or be an elder. So it says, Paul said all three of those things in multiple places. They go, well, what he meant was, and, and they just, they say, no, 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 no. What that word meant is, uh, that women should be good role models. You know what I mean? It's just, it doesn't say that. The words, the words say what they say. But the thoughts become dynamic. So, how did we get off? How did you get me off on that with that wonderful question? <laughs> how do I know the Bible is true? Was the question. Way back here. Why should we believe the Bible? Because Jesus verified the Old Testament, Jesus promised the inspiration of the New Testament. Seven reasons why I personally believe the Bible, because Jesus did, because the apostles and prophets believed, because every time you check it scientifically, historically, it rings dead on. The unbelievable prophecy. By the way, no world religion book other than the Bible has prophecy. You can't find prophecy in the Quran. There's no prophecy in there. The, the Persian whatever that's called, uh, doesn't have prophecy in it. Only the Bible has the signature of God of fulfilled prophecy. Only the Bible has this unified message um, that, like the book of, of uh, the Quran, the, the writings of Muhammad, you know, one of our missionaries uh, spent his life showing how much they've altered the, the key small spent his life studying the the editions of the Quran and how they keep changing it. Uh, there's no consistency, no unity, no tying to the original documents. On top of that, they have this fixation on Jerusalem. Jerusalem's not even mentioned. 
You know what I mean? It's just unbelievable, the, the, un, the lack of unity in the other uh, books and the enduring 25,000 fragmentary pieces and uh, that the Bible has, has uh, survived. And then we can be sure, even if the translation, that we're hearing God's word because Jesus and Paul used translations of the Bible. They were aware of the originals. They consulted them. That's why Paul said, uh, Timothy, bring my scrolls and especially the parchments. He wanted the originals, but he also wanted his, his uh, uh, translations of them and, and his, his studies of them. And so we can trust the Bible, but we do have to make sure that we pick a translation that's tied to the actual inspired words rather than where the world is going with this cut loose the boat, let it float, and we don't want to, you know, offend too many people. So we're going to have a dynamic version, which, by the way, the, the most popular Bible in the world is the NIV, and it's now sold. I think, I think it's owned by Fox News, the same guy, Murdoch, and they're making additions. They're making a, a, a you know, a... Um, gender equality version for the people that don't like God being a man and they're making the gay version that will make them happy and they're making the, you know what I mean? They're just, they even have a Muslim friendly one um, that, that doesn't heavily emphasize the son of God. You know, he, and, and though the original NIV, the, the NIV, whatever they call it, 75 or whatever the original one is, it's morphing. And, and the NIV that you're talking about, that you grew up with, is not the one that, that the next generation is going with. It's a different, it's, it's, it's not tied, it's not anchored to the words. It's moving. And um, it, it's really dangerous because then you can't say uh, that thus says the Lord.